Chapter Eleven of Gladiator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gladiator by Philip Wiley. Chapter Eleven. In a day, the last veil of mist that had shrouded his feelings and thoughts, making them numb and sterile, vanished. In a day Hugo found himself, or believed that he had. In a day his life changed and flung itself on the course which, in a measure, destined its fixation. He never forgot that day. It began in the early morning when the anchor of the freighter thundered into the harbor water. The crew was not given shore leave until noon. Then the mysterious silence of the captain and the change in the ship's course was explained. Through the third officer, he sent a message to the seamen. War had been declared. The seaways were unsafe. The Katrina would remain indefinitely at Marseilles. The men could go ashore. They would report on the following day. The first announcement of the word sent Hugo's blood racing. War. What war? With whom? Why? Was America in it, or interested in it? He stepped ashore and hurried into the city. The populace was in feverish excitement. Soldiers were everywhere, as if they had sprung up magically like the seed of the dragon. Hugo walked through street after street in the furious heat. He bought a paper and read the French accounts of mobilizations of a battle impending. He looked everywhere for someone who could tell him. Twice he approached the American consulate, but it was jammed with frantic and frightened people who were trying only to get away. Hugo's ambition, growing in him like a fire, was in the opposite direction. War! And he was Hugo Danner. He sat at a cafe toward the middle of the afternoon. He was so excited by the contagion in his veins that he scarcely thrilled at the first use of his new and half-mastered tongue. The garçon hurried to his table. Du la bière, Hugo said. The waiter asked a question which Hugo could not understand, so he repeated his order in the universal language of measurement of a large glass by his hands. The waiter nodded. Hugo took his beer and stared out at the people. They hurried along the sidewalk, brushing the table at which he sat. They called to each other, laughed, cried sometimes, and shook hands over and over. La guerre was on every tongue. Old men gestured the directions of battles. Young men, a little more serious perhaps, and often very drunk, were rushing into uniform as order followed order for mobilization. And there were girls, thousands of them, walking with the young men. Hugo wanted to be in it. He was startled by the impact of that desire. All the ferocity of him, all the unleashed wish to rend and kill, was blazing in his soul. But it was a subtle conflagration which urged him in terms of duty, in words that spoke of the war as his one perfect opportunity to put himself to a use worthy of his gift. A war. In a war, what would hold him? What would be superior to him? Who could resist him? He swallowed glass after glass of the brackish beer, quenching a mighty thirst and firing a mightier ambition. He saw himself charging into battle fighting till his ammunition was gone, till his bayonet broke, and then turning like a titan, and doing monster deeds with bare hands and teeth. Bands played and feet marched. His blood rose to a boiling point. A Frenchman flung himself at Hugo's table. And you, why aren't you a soldier? I will be, Hugo replied. Bravo, we shall revenge ourselves. The man gulped a glass of wine, slapped Hugo's shoulder, and was gone. Then a girl talked to Hugo, and then another man. Hugo dwelt on the politics of the war and its sociology only in the most perfunctory manner. It was time the imperialistic ambitions of the central powers were ended. A war was inevitable for that purpose. France and England had been attacked. They were defending themselves. He would assist them. Even the problem of citizenship and the tangle of red tape his enlistment might involve did not impress him. He could see the field of battle, and hear the roar of guns, a picture conjured up by his knowledge of the old wars. What a soldier he would be! While his mind was still leaping and throbbing, and his head was whirling, darkness descended. He would give away his life, 
do his duty and a hundred times more than his duty here was the thing that was intended for him the weapon forged for his hand the task designed for his undertaking war in war he could bring to a full fruition the majesty of his strength no need to fear it there no need to be ashamed of it he felt himself almost the messiah of war the man created at the precise instant he was required his call to serve was sounding in his ears and the bands played the chaos did not diminish at night but rather it increased he went with milling crowds to a bulletin board the germans had commenced to move they had entered belgium in violation of treaties long held sacred belgium was resisting and liege was shaking at the devastation of the great howitzers a terrible crime hugo shook with the rage of the crowd the first outrages and violations highly magnified were reported the blonde beast would have to be broken god damn a voice drawled at hugo's side he turned a tall lean man stood there a man who was unquestionably american hugo spoke in instant excitement there sure is hell to pay the man turned his head and saw hugo he stared at him rather superciliously at his slightly seedy clothes and his strong unusual face american yeah let's have a drink they separated themselves from the mob and went to a crowded cafe the man sat down and hugo took a chair at his side as you put it the man said there is hell to pay let's drink on the payment hugo felt in him a certain aloofness a detachment that checked his desire to throw himself into flamboyant conversation my name's danner he said mine's shane thomas matthew shane i'm from new york so am i in a way i was on a ship that was stranded here by the war at loose ends now shane nodded he was not particularly friendly for a person who had met a countryman in a strange city hugo did not realize that shane had been besieged all day by distant acquaintances and total strangers for assistance in leaving france or that he expected a request for money from hugo momentarily and shane did not seem particularly wrought up by the condition of war they lifted their glasses and drank hugo lost a little of his ardor nice mess time though time the germans got their answer shane's haughty eyebrows lifted his wide thin mouth smiled perhaps i just came from germany seemed like a nice peaceful country three weeks ago oh hugo wondered if there were many pro-german americans his companion answered the thought not that i don't believe the germans are wrong but war is such such a damn fool thing well it can't be helped no it can't we're all going to go out and get killed though we sure america will get in it that's part of the game america is more dangerous to germany than france or england for that matter that's a rather cold-blooded viewpoint shane nodded i've been raised on it garçon l'addition s'il vous plaît he reached for his pocketbook simultaneously with hugo i'm sorry you're stranded he said and if a hundred francs will help i'll be glad to let you have it i can't do more hugo's jaw dropped he laughed a little good lord man i said my ship was stuck not me and these drinks are mine he reached into his pocket and withdrew a huge roll of american bills and a packet of french notes shane hesitated his calmness was not severely shaken however i'm sorry old man you see all day i've been fighting off starving and startled americans and i thought you were one i apologize for my mistake he looked at hugo now with more interest as a matter of fact i'm a little skittish about patriotism and about war of course i'm going to be in it the first entertaining thing that has happened in a dog's age but i'm a conscientious objector on principles i rather thought i'd enlist in the foreign legion tomorrow he was an unfamiliar type to hugo he represented the american who had been educated at home and abroad who had acquired a wide horizon for his views who was bored with the routine of his existence his clothes were elegant and impeccable his face was very nearly inscrutable although he was only a few years older than hugo he made the latter feel youthful they had a brace of drinks two more and two more all about them was bedlam as if the emotions of man had suddenly been let loose to sweep him off his feet 
Grief, joy, rage, lust, fear were all obviously there in almost equal proportions. Shane extended his hand. They have something to fight for, at least. Something besides money and glory. A grudge. I wonder what it is that makes me want to get in. I do. So do I. Shane shook his head. I wouldn't if I were you. Still, you will probably be compelled to in a while. He looked at his watch. Do you care to take dinner with me? I had an engagement with an aunt who is on the verge of apoplexy because two of the Boston Shanes are in Munich. It scarcely seems appropriate at the moment. I detest her anyway. What do you say? I'd like to have dinner with you. They walked down the Canbiere. At a restaurant on the east side near the foot of the thoroughfare, they found a table in the corner. A pair of waiters hastened to take their order. The place was riotous with voices and the musical sounds of dining. On a special table was a great demijohn of 1870 cognac, which was fast being drained by the guests. Shane consulted with his companion and then ordered in fluent French. The meal that was brought approached the perfection of service and the superiority of cooking that Hugo had never experienced. And always the babble, the blare of bands, the swelling and fading persistence of the stringed orchestra, the stream of purple Chateauneau du Pape and its flinty taste, the glitter of the lights and the bright colors on the mosaics that represented the principal cities of Europe. It was a splendid meal. I'm afraid I'll have to ask your name again, Shane said. Danner, Hugo Danner. Good God, not the football player. I did play football some time ago. I saw you against Cornell. When was it? Two years ago. You were magnificent. How does it happen that, that I'm here? Hugo looked directly into Shane's eyes. Well, I have no intention of prying into your affairs. Then I'll tell you. Why not? Hugo drank his wine. I killed a man in the game and quit. Beat it. Shane accepted the statement calmly. That's tough. I can understand your desire to get out from under. Things like that are bad when you're young. What else could I have done? Nothing. What are you going to do? Rather, what were you going to do? I don't know, Hugo answered slowly. What do you do? What do people generally do? He felt the question was drunken, but Shane accepted it at its face value. I'm one of those people who have too much money to be able to do anything I really care about most of the time. The family keeps me in sight and control, but I'm going to cut away tomorrow. In the Foreign Legion? I'll go with you. Splendid. They shook hands across the table. Three hours later found them at another cafe. They had been walking part of the time in the throngs on the street. For a while they had stood outside a newspaper office watching the bulletins. They were quite drunk. Old man, Shane said, I'm mighty glad I found you. Me too, old egg. Where do we go next? I don't know. What's your favorite vice? We can locate it in Marseille. Hugo frowned. Well, vice is so limited in its scope. His companion chuckled. Isn't it? I've always said vice was narrow. The next time I see Aunt Emma, I'm going to say, Emma, vice is becoming too narrow in its scope. She'll be furious, and it will bring her to an early demise, and I'll inherit a lot more money, and that will be the real tragedy. She's a useless old fool, Aunt Emma. Never did a valuable thing in her life. Goes in for charity, just like we go in for golf and what not. Oh, well, to hell with Aunt Emma. Hugo banged his glass on the table. Garçon, encore du whisky à l'eau. And to hell with Aunt Emma. Like to play roulette? Like to try? They climbed into a taxi. Shane gave an address, and they were driven to another quarter of the town. In a room packed with people in evening clothes, they played for an hour. Several people spoke to Shane, and he introduced Hugo to them. Shane won, and Hugo lost. They went out into the night. The streets were quieter in that part of town. Two girls accosted them. That gives me an idea, Shane said. Let's find a phone. Maybe we can get Marcel and Claudine. Marcel and Claudine met them at the door of the old house. Their arms were laden with champagne bottles. The interior of the dwelling belied its cold, gray, ancient stones. Hugo did not remember much of what followed that evening. Short, unrelated fragments stuck in his mind. 
Shane chasing the white form of Marcel up and down the stairs, himself in a huge bathtub, washing a back in front of him, his surprise when he saw daylight through the wooden shutters of the house. Someone was shaking him. Come on, soldier, the leaves up. He opened his eyes and collected his thoughts. He grinned at Shane. All right, but if I had to defend myself right now, I'd fail against a good strong mouse. We'll fix that. Hey, Marcel, got any Fernet Bronca? The girl came with two large glasses of the pick-me-up. Hugo swallowed the bitter brown fluid and shuddered. Claudine awoke. Sherry, she sighed, and kissed him. They sat on the edge of the bed. Boy, Hugo said, what a binge. You like eat? Claudine murmured. He took her hand. Loved it, darling, and now we're going to war. Ah, she said, and at the door, bon chance. Shane left Hugo after agreeing on a time and place for their meeting in the afternoon. The hours passed slowly. Hugo took another drink, and then exerting his judgment and will, he refrained from taking more. At noon he partook of a light meal. He thought or imagined that the ecstasy of the day before was showing some signs of decline. It occurred to him that the people might be very sober and quiet before the war was a thing to be written into the history of France. The sun was shining. He found a place in the shade where he could avoid it. He ordered a glass of beer, tasted it, and forgot to finish it. The elation of his first hours had passed, but the thing within him that had caused it was by no means dead. As he sat there, his muscles tensed with the picturization of what was soon to be. He saw the grim shadows of the enemy. He felt the hot splash of blood. For one suspended second, he was ashamed of himself. And then he stamped out that shame as being something very much akin to cowardice. He wondered why Shane was joining the Legion, and what sort of person he was underneath his rather haughty exterior. A man of character, evidently and one who was weary of the world to which he had been privileged. Hugo's reverie veered to his mother and father. He tried to imagine what they would think of his enlistment, of him in the war, and even what they thought of him from the scant and scattered information he had supplied. He was sure that he would justify himself. He felt purged and free and noble. His strength was a thing of wreck and ruin, given to the world at a time when wreck and ruin were needed to set it right. It was odd that such a product should emerge from the dusty brain of a college professor in a Bible-ridden town. Hugo had not possessed a religion for a long time. Now, wondering on another tangent, if the war might not bring about his end, he thought about it. He realized that he would hate himself for murmuring a prayer or asking protection. He was gamer than the cross-obsessed weaklings who were not wise enough to look life in the face and not brave enough to draw the true conclusions from what they saw. True conclusions? He meditated. What did it matter? Agnosticism? Atheism? Pantheism? Anything but the savage and anthropomorphic twaddle that had been doled out since the Israelites singled out Jehovah from among their many gods, he would not commit himself. He would go back with his death to the place where he had been before he was born and feel no more regret than he had in that oblivious past. Meanwhile, he would fight. He moved restively and waited for Shane with growing impatience. Until that chaotic and gorgeous hour, he had lived for nothing, proved nothing, accomplished nothing. Society was no better in any way because he had lived. He accepted the lives he had saved, the few favors he had done. That was nothing in proportion to his powers. He was his own measure, and by his own efforts would he satisfy himself. War, he flexed his arms. War. His black eyes burned with a formidable light. Then Shane came walking with long strides, a ghostly smile on his lips, a darkness in his usually pale blue eyes. Hugo liked him. They said a few words and walked toward the recruiting tent. A poilu in steely blue looked at them and saw they were good. He proffered papers. They signed. That night they marched for the first time. A week later, they were sweating and swearing over the French manual of arms, Hugo had offered his services to the commanding officer at the camp. 
and been summarily denied an audience or a chance to exhibit his abilities. When they reached the lines, that would be time enough. Well, he could wait until those lines were reached. End of chapter 11